Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Micah from the two LDS archives. Uh, in this video today, this is going to be a little bit different video for me because 75% um, of this uh, video is my typical, um, typical, uh, what would you call it? quality of video? It's research. And the other 25%, I actually go into a little tiny bit of speculation, which uh, I, I don't like to do, but it is fun. So uh, I go into a little bit of that, but I source it pretty good. So uh, I think you will, uh, you'll probably like this video more than any of my other videos, but it's, it's a little bit out of the normal for me, out of my comfort zone, putting stuff up that has a little bit of speculation in it. So... Uh, bear with me on that. And here we have my Diet Pepsi. I'm ready to go. So this video uh, is, or this uh, paper and video is going to be on Satan the Great Counterfeiter. As always, you can go to my website, which is ad-free. It's just my family blog, and you can um, print off these pictures in a, the Word document. Um, word picture, Word document. Did I say pictures? No picture. No picture. Um, for totally for free. It doesn't cost you anything. Just click print and uh, you can skip the videos entirely. Um, trust me, there is absolutely no hard feelings if you'd rather read it. Or uh, if you want to print it off and read it as I go through it, I read and I, and I always make about a half a dozen reading mistakes too, it seems like. But... Uh, and I always find about a half a dozen spelling errors when I go through it too in grammar. So I apologize. Kind of archaic, but this is the way I learn the best. And this, and so, um, and I think it's the best way people can learn. And and I don't base that off of myself or my 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 knowledge. I base that off of the fact that this is how the Lord decided was the best way people um, should and can learn. And He decided that when He wrote all the scriptures that we have. Uh, he didn't give you a picture book. He didn't give you a PowerPoint. He gave you a book with words in it, and you needed to learn how to read. So um, that's why I do it this way. So without further ado, Satan the Great Counterfeiter, President James E. Faust um, of the First Presidency noted, Satan is the great imitator, the master deceiver, the arch counterfeiter, and the greatest forger ever in the history of the world. He comes into our lives as a thief in the night. His disguise is so perfect that it is hard to recognize him or his methods. One of the major techniques of the devil is to cause human beings to think that they are following God's way, when in reality they are deceived by the devil to follow other paths. In the Bible Dictionary, under devil, we learn the English word devil in the King James Version is used to represent several different words in Greek, slanderer, demon, and adversary. And Hebrew, spoiler, the devil is the enemy of all righteousness and of those who seek to do the will of God, literally a spirit son of God. He was at one time an angel in authority in the presence of God. However, he rebelled in the pre-mortal life at which point, at which time he uh, persuaded a third part of the spirit children of the father to rebel with him in opposition to the plan of salvation championed by Jehovah, who was Jesus Christ. Thus came the devil and his angels. They were cast out of heaven and were denied the experience of mortal bodies and earth life. Latter-day Rev Revelation confirms the biblical teaching that the devil is a reality and that he does strive to lead men and women from the work of God. One of the major techniques of the devil is to cause human beings to think they are following God's ways, when in reality they are deceived by the devil to follow other paths. Since the devil and his pre-mortal angels have no physical body of flesh and bones, they often seek to possess the bodies of mortal beings. There are many such instances recorded in Scripture. Such can be evicted by the power of faith in Jesus Christ and the exercise of the Holy Priesthood. Jesus gave this power to his disciples. The devil is called the prince of this world. The adversary, Beelzebub, meaning the prince of the devils, the wicked one, the enemy, Lucifer, Satan, prince of the power of the air, perdition, son of the morning, that old serpent, the great dragon, 
a murderer from the beginning, a liar from the beginning, and the accuser. He is miserable in his situation, in his situation, and stirreth up the children of men unto secret combinations of murder and all manner of secret works of darkness. He tries to imitate the work of God. Now this is interesting, okay? By transforming himself nigh unto an angel of light, he is also a worker of miracles by which he deceives many on the earth. In fact, the scripture says he deceives the whole world. He can cite scriptures to make his point seem plausible. All of this is a scheme to make men miserable like himself. Protection against the influence of the devil is found by obedience to the commandments and laws of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message of all the prophets and apostles is that truth, righteousness, and peace shall in the end prevail over error, sin, and war. The faithful shall triumph over all their afflictions and enemies shall triumph over the devil. There shall be a complete and lasting victory of righteousness over the wickedness of this on this earth, which will be done by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. End quote from the Bible dictionary under devil. Why is this important to recognize? Why is this important to understand? Why do I believe that? We are entering a time period shortly in which the work of the Lord will be accelerated and the things that might seem supernatural or biblical are going to take place. During this, the saints of God are going to need a sense of composure and the ability to stay grounded and have a rock-solid testimony of the Savior and understanding of his gospel. Or, as President Nelson recently said, quote, do whatever it takes to strengthen your faith in Jesus Christ by increasing your understanding of the doctrine taught in his restored church and by relentlessly seeking truth. Anchored in pure doctrine, you will be able to step forward with faith and dog persistence and cheerfully do all that lies in your power to fulfill the purposes of the Lord, end quote. When Satan makes his grand appearance... You are going to need to understand how Satan works and how the Holy Ghost works so that you won't be deceived. This is um, another reason why I believe President Nelson really has been focusing on um, lately how to or how to and the process of hearing him. Okay, This contrast, this difference will determine everything in the days to come. Moses 5, 12 through 14, and Adam and Eve blessed the name of God, and they made all things known unto their sons and their daughters. And Satan came among them, saying, I am also a son of God. And he commanded them, saying, Believe it not. And they believed it not. And they loved Satan more than God. And men began from that time forth to be carnal, sensual, and devilish. And the Lord called upon men by the Holy Ghost everywhere, and commanded them that they should repent. So the Holy Ghost has been around for a while. A couple things of importance to to notice here, one, Satan does not besmirch God. He uses his relationship to God to give himself validity and credibility. This is important to know because a lot of people think that Satan appears in outright opposition to God, when in reality he appears to represent God, but mingles truth with lies. Two, the contrast between those who heed the Holy Ghost and those who heed Satan, the pattern is laid out here all the way back with Adam and his children. This is important to note because the pattern starts with Adam but and will continue to the end of the end of time. Moses 5, 16, 18, and Adam and Eve, his wife, ceased not to call upon God. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, wherefore he may not reject his words. But behold, Cain hearkened not, saying, Who is the Lord that I should know him? And she again conceived and bare his brother Abel, and Abel hearkened unto the voice of the Lord, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground, and Cain loved Satan more than God. So what do we learn from this? That Abel hearkened unto the Holy Ghost and the, the Lord, and Cain loved Satan and hearkened unto him. Continuing Moses 5.18, And Satan commanded Cain, saying, Make an offering unto the Lord. Now, this crucial bit of information allows us with a clarity to understand how Satan works. Satan did not command Cain to offer a sacrifice to him, but rather to the Lord. Why? Because he knew that if Cain offered a sacrifice to the Lord for the sole reason that Satan told him to do it, the Lord would be unable to accept the gift. He'd have to refuse it because it was coming from Satan. 
this is an act of rebellion. For more information on acts of rebellion versus the acts of weakness, see my paper or watch the video, which I have done, rebellion versus weakness. Satan knew that this rejection would get Cain wroth. Reading again, further in Moses 5.21, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. Now Satan knew this and it pleased him and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. The Lord then proceeds to try to explain what Satan had done to Cain, which caused Cain to get even more upset and leave. He did that between verses 23 to 25. We read in verse 26, And Cain was wroth and listened not any more to the voice of the Lord, neither to Abel his brother, who walked in holiness before the Lord. Satan then takes Cain and gives him the oath that he must swear for their covenant to be made. We read about that in verse 29. And Satan said unto Cain, Swear unto me by thy throat, and if thou tell it, thou shalt die, and swear thy brethren by their heads and by the living God, that they tell it not. For if they tell it, they shall surely die, and this that thy father may not know it, Adam. And this day I will deliver thy brother Abel into thine hands. Not only does this mimic the covenant that we make with the Lord, Satan has his followers swear by the living God, once again using the name of God for his own benefits. The pattern of people tricking people into thinking they're actually serving God starts here. You could say this is literally the birth of Satan's religion. A couple things interesting to note about Satan's religion is that they swear oaths to God, and those who break the oaths are beheaded. Now, I want you to put this on your the back burner, and I want you to think about which religions around the world, or rather, one religion, that, the, that teaches this. Another important bit of information was that these pacts were done in secret, especially from that of the modern-day prophet or patriarch, which in this case was Adam. Continue to read, and Satan swear unto Cain that he would do according to his commands, and all these things were done in secret. And Cain said, Truly, I am Mahan, the master of this great secret, that I may murder and get gain. Wherefore, Cain was called Master Mahan, and he gloried in, in his wickedness. And Cain went into the field, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass that while they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And Cain gloried in, in which he had done, saying, I am free. Surely the flocks of my brother falleth into my hands. So Cain made the oath, killed his brother, but what Cain said, said after it is truly informative, for it gives us the why of the deed. Why did Cain make such an oath? Why did Cain kill his brother? So what did Cain say? He said, I'm free. And he said, now I will get my brother's stuff. Satan promised him two things in killing his brother, that Cain would be free and that Cain would get Abel's things. So we know that that secret com and we so we know that secret combinations from the very beginning were set up to get gain and to avoid laws. We also know that the great and abominable church main purpose is to get gain. Read about that in First Nephi thirteen four, th four through nine, which was also founded by the devil, but is actually a separate entity. But what about the freedom promised? Freedom from what? God's law. This was one of Satan's famous half-truths. Satan promised him that he would be free from God's law if he killed his brother, but he most likely didn't specify to Cain that this freedom from the law does not occur until after judgment and after the sons of perdition are cast out into outer darkness. For we know that all kingdoms have a law save for outer darkness, which is made for those who could not abide any law. So you could say they are free from law. This is reflected when the Savior asks Cain, where is your brother? And Cain's reply is, am I my brother's keeper? He thought himself free from God's laws. Cain was then cast out and his posterity cursed. Seth was given to, to Adam as, as a child, and through Seth, the righteous posterity was given to the earth. But did the mimicry of Satan cease? No. Looking below at the posterity of Cain and the posterity of Seth, it is easy to see the mimicry. 
Now you can see here you have Abel who perished, you have Cain's kids, and you have Seth's kids. Now if you look here, you know you can start to see these uh, these uh, the mimicry here. Can you see the mimicry? I hope so. Did the mimicry end with just the posterity names? No. There are people even today in the church who refer to Enoch's translated city as the city of Enoch, which is incorrect. Enoch city, which was translated, was called the city of holiness, even Zion. Cain built a city, an evil city, and he called the name of the city the city of Enoch after his son Enoch. Moses 5:42 One of the most righteous cities the world the world has ever seen shares a mirrored identity a similar name a geographical location time period etc with one of the more evil cities run by Satan This is how Satan works I could document hours worth of mimicry, but needless to say, it happened all the way from the time of Adam to Abraham. But I want to skip straight to Abraham. Um, the reasons for doing this are many. Obviously, time is an issue. But more importantly, the mimicry that occurs around Abraham is extremely important for us to understand today. Now that I have explained Cain versus Seth, the story of Abraham and the deception around him will sound eerily familiar. Abraham couldn't have a child. His wife was barren. Abraham then had a son through his wife's handmaiden. His name was Ishmael. And I want you to think Cain. After that, Abraham's wife bore a son and named Isaac. And I want you to think Abel or Seth. It is unclear what happened next, but what we do know is that Ishmael was mocking Isaac. Paul in the New Testament clarifies this in Galatians 4, 28-31. Quote, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then Ishmael, that was born after the flesh, persecuted Isaac, that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scriptures? Cast out the bondswoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Hagar and her son Ishmael were cast out, and as the Old Testament student manual makes clear for Genesis 17, 18 through 21, quote, the birthright was given to Isaac, the first son of the first wife, rather than to Ishmael, who was the first son of the Abra Abraham, of the first son of Abraham and Hagar and was about 14 years older than Isaac. So once again, we have Cain being older than Abel and Seth. The Lord made it clear that on, in accordance with the, ori the original promise, Abraham's son by Sarah would bear the covenant responsibility. Yet Ishmael, through his 12 sons, was also to be the father of a great nation. End quote from the manual. So Abraham's older son, Ishmael, okay, like Cain, he sprouted forth 12 sons which became 12 tribes. And Abraham's younger son, Isaac's posterity, sprouted off 12 sons, which became 12 tribes. Once again, what are the odds? Through Isaac, we have Judaism, the birth of the Savior, and then Christianity. Through Ishmael, we have Islam. It is also important to note that Ishmael got his wife from Egypt, and it was said that Hagar, his mother, was also from Egypt, meaning not only was Hagar from the loins of Ham, so was Ishmael's wife. What does that mean? It means that the lineage of Cain continued in that line, just as it did in the days of Adam, mimicking the righteous line. Today, we have a pretty good idea of where a couple of the tribes of Israel are. But the majority of them, what are commonly called the ten lost tribes of Israel, were taken away and hidden by the Lord. What befell the lost ten tribes of Israel has been a point of curiosity and mystery for both those inside and outside the church. In similar fashion, tribes of Ishmael can no longer be traced, with some modern Arabs claiming ancestry to Ishmael, but the body of them being uncertain. Not only that, Shia Muslims believe not only that the tribes of Ishmael vanished, they also believe that their 13th imam, a direct descendant of Muhammad, 
was put in a well and was hidden in the earth. She has referred to this as occultation, which means the state of being hidden from view or lost to notice, or when one object is hidden by another object that passes between it and the observer. The LDS would understand this concept as the veil. So the Muslims believe that that groups of their tribe, including the all-important leader, were taken away and hidden in the earth, and a veil was placed over them to hide them. They also teach that when the time is right in the last days, Allah will remove this veil, revealing them, and will bring them forth. I will get to this more specifically later. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints teaches that the ten tribes were led away by prophets and were hidden in the earth in the north. They also believe that when the time is right, in the last days, the prophet with the keys to do so, Joseph Smith, will stand as an ensign and call them home. The Lord will then reveal them and they will come forth being led by a translated John the Revelator. Are you not starting to see the problem? Can both of these prophecies be true at the same time? The answer is yes. In the manuals we learn from a multitude of in the manuals we learn from a multitude of LDS prophets, apostles, and scholars that when the ten tribes are being led north as a body, that groups of these people broke off over the course of their journey, leaving the body of the group. And this is where we get the scattering of Israel. When Moses restored the keys to Joseph Smith, he gave him the keys to gather Israel and to lead the ten tribes back. The tenth article of faith states we believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes. So we know that there is a body up north, but we also know that some broke off. Elder Reynolds wrote, it is altogether improbable that in that long journey of one and a half years, as Ezra states it, from Media, the land of their captivity to the frozen north, some of the backsliding Israel rebelled, turned aside from the main body, forgot their God, by and by mingled with the Gentiles, and became the leaven to the leaven to leaven with the promised seed all the nations of the earth. The account given in the Book of Mormon of a single family of this same house, its waywardness, its stiff-neckedness before God, its internal quarrels and family feuds are, we fear, an example on a small scale of what most people probably, what most probably happened in the vast bodies of Israelites who, for so many months, wended their tedious way northward. Laman and Lemuel had, no doubt, many counterparts in the journeying ten tribes. And who so likely to rebel as stubborn, impudent, proud, and warlike Ephraim? Rebellion and backsliding have been so characteristic, char characteristically the story of Ephraim's career that he can scarcely conceive that it could be otherwise and yet preserve the uh, unities of the people's history. Can it be any wonder then that so much of the blood of Ephraim has been found hidden and unknown in the midst of the nations of northern Europe and other parts until the spirit of prophecy revealed its existence, end quote. So in summary, to repeat the general idea, the ten tribes were, were led by prophets northward, and as they went north, groups of them broke off, but eventually the main body made it to where it was going and was hidden by the Lord. Now, Reynolds, McConkie, as well as many others, used the story in the Book of Mormon to extrapolate what most likely happened to the Israelites as they traveled. Now, using that same logic, may I extrapolate and suggest a few things on my own? And here's where we're getting into uh, my speculation, which I don't typically do, but here we go. One, Lehi took Ishmael's family with him. He did not go alone. Zoram also journeyed with them. It is altogether probable that the ten tribes not only lost people along the way, but that they also gained or took people just as Lehi did with his family. Two, once they arrived, 
they found that they, they found there were other groups there that the Lord had led there as well, such as the Mulekites. It is altogether probable that even if the Israelites didn't take large amounts of people with them, that other groups of people were led to the same location, just like in the Book of Mormon. Point three, once they arrived there, everything wasn't hunky-dory. Everyone didn't hold hands and sing Kumbaya. They had their problems, strifes, wars, just like every other body of people, just like we learned about in the Book of Mormon. Now, may I be so bold as to suggest that the major group that chose to go with the ten tribes was that of the descendants of Ishmael. When the Israelites were freed from Assyria, Elder George Reynolds wrote of their journey, quote, the first portion of their journey was not, however, north. According to the accounts of Esdras, they, appears to, they appear to have first moved in the direction of their old homes, and it is it is possible that they originally started with the intention of returning there to, or probably in order to deceive the Assyrians, they started as if to return to Canaan. Canaan. <clears throat> now that's important. And when they had crossed the Euphrates and were out of danger from the hosts of the Medes and the Persians, pause, then they turn, turned their journeying's feet towards the polar star. Then they turned their journeying feet toward the polar star. That's a good sentence. And quote, where would fleeing Israelite refugees turn for supplies, aid, shelter, food, etc. South of the Euphra Euphrates, in between Assyria and their own homeland. Rakhmu or modern day Petra, Jordan. Unlike the story of Lehi, whose journey seemed to take a long time, with them staying in areas and having children, gathering enough food to get them to the next point, and then repeating. The account of Ezra states that the ten tribes traveled directly, however, for a year and a half, and then were hidden. What can one infer from this? That they had a surplus of supplies that enabled them to travel for a year and a half straight, rather than having to stop for food, etc. Refugees fleeing from captivity would not have had these supplies. And if the supplies were being provided from heaven, the body would not have broken up as it did. It is more than probable that they went to their cousins, the Nabataeans or the Odorites, two of the son of Ishmael, and convinced a large number of them to journey off together, exactly like Lehi did with Ishmael. I also find it fascinating that uh, his name was Ishmael. It is also highly probable that before calamity struck that part of the world, that other tribes of Ishmael were led north separately by the Lord or Satan, just like the Mulekites were led to America. Lastly, we can assume that this combined body of people, wherever they are hidden, have a lot of different ites making it up. But the majority of them are probably separated like the Nephites and Lamanites were, with one body being led by John the Revelator and the other body being led by someone else. Could the two bodies be cohabiting without war? Yes, it's possible. There were many years when the Nephites and Lamanites never fought. We don't know their condition, and we don't know their agreements between each other. We don't know their laws, their constitution, etc. But may I point out that the only way we know historically that two groups of people with vastly different religions, culture, race, etc. have coexisted in the same area for prolonged periods of time, in this case it might be over 2,000 years, without one group being annihilated, is with some form of slavery. So put a pin in this. We will get back to this later. That being said, what do we do know? We do know 
that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know that Satan mimics God in all things. If we believe that God has a group of his followers that will form Zion, and he has another group of hidden people that he will reveal and bring forth out of the earth, out of darkness, to join with those people in Zion and help build New Jerusalem, what makes you think that God won't allow Satan to provide the mimicry here? Continuing in that line of thought, if God has two groups that he plans to bring together in the last days, two groups that miraculously don't know any specifics about each other, but yet share the exact same faith, Satan will mimic it. Having two groups that are separated that he will combine, that don't know any specifics about each other, but yet share the exact same faith. In Revelation 13, the JST makes it very clear, quote, And I saw another sign in the likeness of the kingdoms of the earth, end quote. Meaning this beast of seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns is symbolic. And its coming forth is symbolic. Yet, there is no JST for Revelation 13, 11, quote, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns, like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, end quote. Meaning that this individual could quite literally be coming from in the earth. The New Testament manual states, For Revelation 13, 11 through 17, a second beast spake as a dragon. Quote, Revelation 13, 11 tells of a second beast that John saw. He later identified this beast as the false prophet. This second beast had two horns like a lamb, but spake as a dragon. This description suggests that the second beast will seek to appear to represent Christ, while actually teaching the false doctrines of Satan. The deception of the second beast is also reminiscent of the Savior's warning to beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves, end quote from the manual. So what do we learn? We learn of a false prophet that may or may not be coming from the earth itself, who seeks to represent Jesus Christ himself. Well, what does Islam teach? The 13th Imam, who was a descendant of Muhammad, who was to usher in their end-time prophecy, was hidden in a well in the earth. Muslims to this day write letters and drop them down the well, written to this man. They believe that when he comes forth from the earth, he will bring with him Jesus Christ, quote, who is a Muslim and will serve as his deputy, end quote. Going back to Revelation 13, 12 through 15. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Okay? Going back to the doctrine of Islam, what do they teach? Well, they teach, quote, Muslims believe the Mahdi, the 13th Amman, will return in the last days to establish righteousness, justice, and peace. When he comes, they say, the Mahdi will bring Jesus with him. 
Jesus will be a Muslim and will serve as his deputy, not as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as the Bible teaches. And he will force non-Muslims to choose between following the Mahdi or death. Okay, now this is a direct quote from uh, Islam Teachings Online. Okay, I didn't piece that together. That's what they say about their, their faith. So what do we learn here? One, the first beast and the Antichrist group that come from the earth share the same religion. Quote, he exercised with all the power of the first beast. End quote. When the ten tribes come to Zion, can't it also be said of them that they cause or want the world to worship in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? That they, the ten tribes, exercise the same powers as the church? If there was not a common religion tying these two groups together, the Antichrist group that has all that power would subjugate not only the world, but also the first beast, but it doesn't, meaning they're working together. Are there any prophecies among Catholics or Christians in general, Hindus, Buddhists, etc., that if a group appeared and said, hey, worship this religion or you're going to die, that the religion would be united? There is only one other religion on the planet other than Islam that teaches this doctrine. And what is that religion? That religion is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We teach that the ten tribes will come back. They will share the same faith as us. And the rest of the world will have a choice. And if they choose not to unite with us, they, quote, will be destroyed both temporally and spiritually. Two, we learn that directly before the appearance of this Antichrist, that the state of the beast kingdom is not healthy. One of the heads dies. This Antichrist swoops in and saves the day, healing the deadly wound. What other religion on the planet, other than Islam, teaches of a similar event? Once again, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We teach that the years of tribulation kick in, the Assyrian, the scourge, rises, and that deliverance is given through the remnant which shall return. One might say that the church at that day might be, quote, wounded even unto death, end quote. Or as Isaiah says, quote, the carcasses are being torn in half in the streets, end quote. Point three, the Antichrist calls fire down from heaven and deceives people by the power of miracles. We also teach of our prophets calling down fire from heaven and performing many mighty miracles, including the creation of an ice highway. Four, the Antichrist makes an image to the beast when a country or group, or, or group of countries get together and they seek to create an image to represent themselves. What's the first thing that they make? A flag. But this flag could speak. So what does that mean? It means it wasn't just imagery. It had words on it. The Antichrist, the Antichrist then, after making a flag with words on it, words that worshipped the beast, caused that all those who would not worship or swear fealty to the flag should be killed. Firstly, is there anything in Catholicism or Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism that this could apply to? The answer is no. Is there anything in Islam that this could apply to? The answer is yes. Yes, Islam, every time it attempts to create a caliphate, or in other words, it attempts to combine multiple Islamic countries into one country, i.e. like a little horn consuming three horns and making one horn. It does so under a caliphate flag. The caliphate flag speaks. It is a banner with words on it. Typically a black banner with white words on it. Many of these flags include the Shahada on it. We will get to that soon. Is there anything in LDS doctrine that is similar to this? 
The answer is yes. Moroni, for example, with his title, title of Liberty, in which he did unite multiple groups into one group, and he did so with a flag, a flag that Moroni caused to speak, meaning he wrote on it. Moroni then made everyone swear fealty to that flag, or he killed them. A flag which was most likely white with black words on it. It's also interesting to note that freedom lovers in America also have a flag similar to the title of liberty called the Gadsden flag. What's on that flag? It is a rattlesnake or serpent that speaks. And what does it say? Don't tread on me. Going back to Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. There are many people who believe that this mark will be forced on Gentile countries that are predominantly Christian in Europe by inside forces, i.e., which is the predominant Christian religions themselves. The predominant Christian religion themselves. This mark is a religious mark. So I ask the question, is there anything taught by Catholics or other Christian sects in Europe that could be used to convince them to do this? The answer is no. They're freaking out right now over vaccines, which means that this mark is being forced on them by another religion that is now subjugating them. There are also people who believe that this mark is something like vaccines, barcodes, implants. But what do we know about this mark? We know, one, that it bears the name of the beast. It bears the name of the false god. Two, that it speaks many words that are blasphemous to God. Three, the mark of the beast is the image of the beast. It represents the group of countries and the second beast, which represents it. John identifies this second beast clearly as the false prophet or the Antichrist. What does this mean? Does this mean vaccines? Does this mean teaching a different Christianity, like Catholics versus Presbyterians versus LDS? So what is an Antichrist? An Antichrist is clearly identified as any persons, organizations, religions, etc., that teaches that Jesus Christ is not the Savior of the world. So we know that this mark of the beast, what makes it so blasphemous, is that it openly proclaims this specific doctrine. In summary, the mark of the beast has to have the power to identify people as antichrists. It has to have the power to speak words associated with, with it. And lastly, it has to bear the name of the beast. To believe that Catholics or any Christian denomination could, be conv could convince its members to wear such a token or badge or mark, I believe is ludicrous. This will be forced upon people by the sword. There are only two religions on the planet that teach that Jesus isn't the Christ, Judaism and Islam. But can the Antichrist be Jewish? The answer is no, because the Antichrist leads the armies to destroy Israel. Would an Antichrist that represents Judaism seek to destroy Judaism? No. So the only religion on the planet that fits the bill is Islam. Does Islam practice anything similar to this already? The answer is yes. Islam teaches that those who do not accept the doctrine of Islam should have their heads taken off. And what is their doctrine? That Allah is their God and that Jesus Christ was not the Savior. 
Now comes in the topic of the Shahada. The Shahada is an Islamic creed testimony declaring beliefs in the oneness of God and the acceptance of Muhammad as God's messenger. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Where do they wear this? They wear it on their head in the form of a bandana and on their arm as an armband. It is also important to note that those that wear or wore this badger mark, when they died, they, quote, did curse God and die. Meaning that they recited or read the mark of the beast or something similar to it with their last breaths. So what are the Muslims taught to say right before they die? Their declaration of faith in which they reconfirm their beliefs in Allah, Prophet Muhammad, the 12 Imams, the Quran, and the Day of Judgment, and the Statement of Farak, which I don't know how to pronounce that, which states that there is no God but Allah. To John, this would be cursing God and dying. Continuing with Revelation 14, 9 through 11, and the th- and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and received his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name, Revelation 16. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there was fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped, once again, worshipped his image. A lot of people, I, I, are, are, are people really worshipping a vaccine? And upon them which worshipped his image. And men were scorched with great heat and, and blasphemed the name of God. So, so you're, you're telling me what? These people with vaccines are all of a sudden, you know, you know, swearing fealty to some other God when they die? Which had power over these plagues, and they repented not, not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blaspheming the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth, under the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Revelation 19. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that, that wrought miracles before him, and which he deceived them, that he had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain, seems like there's two people there, huh? Slain with a sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The judgments that are poured out upon this religion and upon the Gentiles that have accepted the mark are described in great detail detail up to and culminating in the Valley of Decision, i.e. the Battle of Armageddon or the Battle of Armageddon. This is supposed to be of. Battle of Armageddon, i.e. the Mount of Olives. I believe it is ludicrous to come to the conclusion that Catholicism, Presbyterianism, Hinduism, or just the Gentile nations in general could or will be convinced to stand in the valley at that day. Even those Gentiles who aren't super converted to Christianity have to realize that this is not a good place to be. Who would stand in this valley proudly and with faith in their God or in their beast? Who would do that? Islam teaches that there are two devils, 
America is the great devil and Jerusalem is the little devil. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints teaches that the law will go forth from Zion, Jackson County, Missouri, New Jerusalem, America, and the word will go forth from Jerusalem. The church also teaches that the new Jerusalem has to be built before the old Jerusalem is redeemed. Therefore, the new Jerusalem is greater in importance to the old Jerusalem. Islam teaches to destroy America, then destroy Israel. We learn in Revelation that the beast tries to kill the child, which is new Jerusalem. And when it can't get it, the focus is then changed to Israel. Name another religion, country, group of countries, etc. That as soon as they get a, got enough power, they would want to destroy America. And then, when it couldn't destroy America, it would then immediately try to destroy Israel. Who has that much hatred towards them both? Who has these two at the top of their list? And who would have enough faith, blind faith, I might add, to not only stand in the Valley of Decision, but as they are dying, would still recite their curse to God with their dying breaths? The army that is described as doing all these horrible things is described as the Northern Army. It's found in Joel. The ten tribes are said to be hidden in the North Countries. Isaiah asks the question repeatedly, Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? And the Lord's response is always, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. The Lord also says that his servant, his latter-day servant, will have a work to do as Moses he will be like Moses and do the things as Moses did. Moses freed a group of Israelites from slavery, bondage, captivity, from a group of people who were descendants of Cain. There is a very good chance that the ten tribes are in bondage, captivity, slavery to the descendants of Cain. There's also a very good chance that the Antichrist and his army will make their appearance to the world from the North countries. And there is a very good chance that the ten tribes will be among them. These North countries are around Northern Europe. From what we know of their journeying to get there, when the prophets among them will no longer stay their hands, when the ensign which, which is Joseph Smith is raised up and calls them home, they will make their exodus just like that of Moses before. When they reach the water, ice will flow down at their presence and will form an ice highway in which they can escape. Some might wonder why the army wouldn't just follow the ten tribes over to North America. But we learn that only the righteous will be able to walk on the highway and the unrighteous will be killed, much like Pharaoh setting troops to kill the ancient Israelites and being swallowed up in the sea. We have this in the book of Revelation as well. Quote, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Note that water can mean people. We also know that the waters themselves will be cursed. In Doctrine and Covenant 61, we read, Behold, I, the Lord, in the beginning blessed the waters, but in the last days, by the mouth of my servant John, I cursed the waters. Wherefore, the days will come, hasn't come yet, that no flesh shall be safe upon the waters. And it shall be said in days to come that none is able to go up to the land of Zion upon the waters, but he that is upright in heart. The servant John spoken of is John the Revelator, who will be one of the principal people leading the ten tribes to Zion. And this would also explain the last verse in Revelation 12. And 
quote, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. And and now it can't go and get um, the people in Zion because he can't cross the water. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Lord describes this great northern army coming the slaves in that army rising up and fleeing in Doctrine and Covenants 87. And it shall come to pass that there are many days slaves shall rise up against their masters who shall be marshaled and disciplined for war. And it shall come to pass also that the remnants who are left of the land will marshal themselves and shall become exceedingly angry and shall vex the Gentiles with a sore vexation. And thus with the sword and by bloodshed the inhabitants of the earth shall mourn and with famine and plague and earthquake and the thunders of heaven and the fierce and vivid lightning also shall the inhabitants of the earth be made to feel the wrath and indignation and the chastening hand of the almighty God until the consummation decreed hath made a full end of all nations that the cry of the saints and the blood of the saints shall cease to come up into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath from the earth to be avenged of their enemies wherefore stand ye in holy places and be not moved until the day of the Lord come. For behold, it cometh quickly, saith the Lord. Amen. Jeremiah said, oh, I skipped one. Joseph Smith said, I skipped one. Joseph Smith said, the city of Zion spoken of by David in the 102nd Psalm will be built upon the land of America and the ransomed of the Lord shall return. So that's interesting, the word ransomed again. And come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. And then they will be delivered from the overflowing scourge that shall pass through the land. But Judah shall obtain the deliverance at Jerusalem. Joseph then tells you to see these uh, other references. This is found in the teachings of the prophet, page 17. So let's go to Jeremiah and let's read that. For there shall be in a day that the watchman upon the mount of Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. Now, if you've read my Joseph Smith shall return, you should be recognizing this. Sounds an awful lot like uh, Joseph Smith coming back. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country. And gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the women with child, and her that travaileth with child together. A great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping, and with supplication will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of the waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble, for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the words of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles far off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, and shall flow together to, to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the of the flock and of the herd and their souls shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow any more at all satan is the great imitator the prophet joseph smith shall return and will call the ten tribes home and the two bodies of saints will become one the antichrist will rise up and combine two groups of his followers and a false Jesus could even be in their midst. People will need a testimony, not only of Jesus Christ, the prophet, but also that he is the son of God and he is the redeemer of the world for the doctrine that Jesus Christ is not the savior of the world is what the antichrist and his religion will be forcing upon people. The deception will come through the loins of Cain, or in other words, the loins of Ham, or in other words, the loins of Ishmael, 
because such deceptions and mimicry from Satan has always come from the loins of Cain. The Lord is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. It is better to die with the testimony and with it, with that testimony and faith than it will be for those who accept the mark of the beast and blaspheme God. What happened? Another one? Pointing doesn't do anything. You can talk. <laughs> oh, I spelled who wrong. You just say that. My wife just points an ear, eerie finger at the screen and doesn't move. What is it? It's my grave. I had a, a nightmare before. What was that movie? That book. The three, the three ghosts show up and points at the grave. This is your grave. Christmas Carol. I had a Mickey Mouse Christmas Carol moment there. On my right, it was pretty creepy. So anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed this. <laughs> I uh, had a little bit of a, I guess, lighter beat at the end of this video. Um, there's a lot of scriptures in Micah, Joel, uh, Isaiah, uh, and just tons of scriptures that have reference to this this army that comes from the ground as insects. Micah has a has a verse where he actually says they come from holes in the ground, and and start consuming people. It's the last chapter of Micah, and I think that. Depending on the reception of this, uh, I'll do a video actually ex going through all those references um, if you if people want to, to read it or people want to know about it. Um, they Joel, Micah, Isaiah, just everywhere that you can look in those scriptures, all the ones that Joseph actually listed here and more. Um, I know that Jesus is the Christ, and I know that this is going to get ugly, and I think people are, are thinking it's going to be a little easier than it is. Like, oh, I'll just not take a vaccine. No, there's going to be somebody showing up who's going to say, deny that Jesus is the Christ, or I'm going to take your head off. And people are going to have to make that decision, and you're going to have to decide, do, do, do I love the Savior enough to die with his testimony, or am I going to deny Jesus and receive the mark? And uh, that's um, that's what's coming your way, and uh, things are going to become biblical. People, things are going to become pretty miraculous. Um, I pray, brothers and sisters, that you do as Nelson said: you increase your strength in the Savior of the world, and increase your knowledge of the doctrine, and so that that way, when these things come forward or start happening, you can, as Nelson said, step forward with dogged persistence and overcome every obstacle that is in your way. And I share that with you in Jesus' name, amen.